We are continuing the commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. The last times we started with chapter 1 and we did the first 10 verses. And today we will continue with uh, verse 11 from chapter 1. Just to quickly summarize, last time we discussed a little bit about the background. We talked about the, the, the general story of the Mahabharata to get an idea of what the Bhagavad Gita is about. Two warring armies, warring cousins, the Kauravas, 100 Kauravas opposing the five Pandavas. And this is a symbol of the negative qualities of the mind versus the positive qualities of the mind. We shortly mentioned the, um, the idea of qualification, and, uh, which is also known as Adhikar, and I mentioned uh, the importance of Buddhi the last time. So, verse 11, I'm reading only the English, says, Standing according to your assignments, in the divisions and at all the major entry points of the battle formation, all of you should surround and protect the Commander-in-Chief Bhishma alone. So these words are spoken by Duryodham. Duryodham is the, uh, the eldest of the Kauravas and he is, um, one can say, uh, representing all the negative qualities that we have in our minds. All of us have positive as well as negative qualities and Duryodham is representing these negative qualities. They have a very large army. The Kaurava army is very large but it is still well matched by the smaller Pandava army because they have Krishna. Krishna who symbolizes Buddhi on their side. So, Duryodham has now seen the Pandava formation, the armies, and he's getting a little concerned because he sees some very, very strong warriors, great heroes on the other side, and he's getting a little bit nervous. Why does one get nervous? When you know you're in the wrong, then your conscience always pricks you. So whatever action you do, if you do not do it in a, in the, with the right conscience, in the right spirit, you know you are wrong, or you know that your stance is not exactly 100% correct, then you're always shaky. And that is why he is not very confident. He's losing confidence, he's very worried, about the Commander-in-Chief, commander Bhishma. Bhishma is a very interesting character. We should know about Bhishma, one, that he was one of the greatest warriors. He has been given the boon of choosing the time of his uh, death, which means no man can kill him. No man can kill him he can decide when he wants to die. He has that boon that has been given to him. So, we have a very great warrior, a very old, wise man, Bhishma, who has practically raised both the Kauravas as well as the Pandavas. They called him Grand Sire. He was their grand uncle. And... They hold him in great respect, both the sides, Kauravas as well as the Pandavas. Yeah, was that somebody asking something? Yeah, yeah it was uh, me. Uh, yeah, Krishna. So, uh, I have a picture of what uh, Krishna and uh, the Pandavas and the Kauravas represent inside yeah. us. So, who does Bish, what does Bhishma represent inside us? Or is it, um, so when, you say, when you say someone who can decide his own death? Yes, yes. Uh, I just want to clarify one thing before I explain the symbolism behind Bhishma, which I'm about to do, is like all symbols, every 
all symbols must be taken for what they are but we can also stretch them and when we start stretching them they, they become rather silly you know they lose their meaning so we can't stretch the symbolism too much too far so you must always remember that if we don't understand symbolism if we take things literally we can also get into a lot of trouble for example, we take the symbolism of Kali, the goddess Kali. Um, she's supposedly the bloodthirsty goddess and she's killing Asuras, etc. And um, this has lead to, led to a kind of a misunderstanding where people think oh, she's a bloodthirsty goddess and therefore they started performing human sacrifices because she has skull heads around her neck they started performing human sacrifices. The meaning behind this is, no, don't start human sacrifices, but sacrifice that part in yourself and become divine. You know, that part in you, which is negative, which is uh, egotistical, that ego should be sacrificed. And that is the deeper symbolism behind that. So we should remember this about the Mahabharat or the Bhagavad Gita that all that we understand here has to be taken in the right spirit. We should not stretch, stretch the symbols too far. Bhishma, we must know about this, about Bhishma, he was a celibate. The reason he got this boon that he could die whenever he wanted was because he took the great oath, the great oath of celibacy. He vowed to take care of the kingdom. Now, if you think about that and contemplate on this idea, celibacy is a symbol of not losing your energies, not putting your energies in the external world, but withdrawing your energies and using the energy to attain the highest, the highest good, the highest good for all. So he takes care of everybody. He's the grandsire. He looks after all of them, the Kauravas as well as the Pandavas, a very selfless soul. And he represents that part in us that is eternal. So Bhishma, however, has a conflict. He knows that he is on the wrong side of this battlefield. He has tried very often to convince Duryodhan that, that he should give in to the demands of the Pandavas. But Duryodhan, being very negative, has not accepted. What this means is there is a part in you which says these are negative qualities, let go of them. Let's strengthen the positive qualities. But there is a part which is not agreeing to that. Now Bhishma is trying to convince Duryodham and he's not listening. So you can well imagine that he has a conflict. He has sworn to serve the king Dhritarashtra, the blind king. And now he knows he's on the wrong side of the battlefield. And so anyone who has a conflict cannot have a one-pointed mind. What is a one-pointed mind? For a lot of people who read books, because their understanding comes from books, people think one-pointed means being concentrated. It means using willpower to focus one's attention on the object of concentration, whatever it may be. It may be your breath, it may be a mantra, it may be even something in the external world. But it is not possible to use willpower for a longer period of time. We know that the mind tires. Some conflicts pull us down, our samskaras basically pull us out of that concentration. We cannot hold 
concentration for a very long time and therefore what do we need to do if we want to attain a spontaneous natural and effortless concentration we need to remove conflicts that is what it means to have a one-pointed mind it's a very simple process of learning to be aware of yourself your own thoughts your mind your desires your fears and looking at them understanding that these are in conflict and learning to let those go that are not useful it's a process which requires self-awareness first and foremost and that's very important we have four aspects in the mind there is buddhi chitta ahankara and manas and when these four are coordinated and there are no conflicts between these four then we have a one-pointed mind and such a one-pointed mind can attain the highest states of meditation without struggle without much effort so that is required and here we have an example of bhishma who has a conflict so duryodhan who is aware that what he is doing is not exactly right he's getting nervous he's he's full of fears and so he says we need to protect the commander in chief we need to protect bhishma so we move on to the next a uh, few verses verse 12 causing duryodhan great joy the elder of the kurus the grandfather bhishma a man of splendor loudly roaring a lion roar blew the conch and conches kettle drums tabors drums and trumpets suddenly blared forth and that sound was tumultuous then standing in a great chariot drawn by white horses krishna and arjun also blew their celestial conches krishna the lord of senses blew his conch named panchajanya and arjun the winner of wealth drew blew his conch named devadatta bhima he of fierce deeds blew his great conch named paundra king yudhishthira the son of kunti blew the conch ananta vijaya nakula and sahadev blew their conches named sughosha and mani pushpaka respectively the king of kashi the excellent archer as well as shikandi the great charioter dishta dyumna virata and the un in the unconquerable satyaki drupada and the sons of dravati each and every one o king the mighty armed son of subhadra they all blew their conches each his own so these are v- v- verses 12 to 18 and this sets uh, the battlefield the picture of the battlefield that's the setting and we are getting a feel of this before i continue to explain this um uh, a question from shri ram why did bhishma side with the kauravas for the same reason shri ram that you when you are at your job sometimes do things that your conscience may not always agree with when we live in this world sometimes we need to make compromises and he was that was his duty because he had sworn to serve the king who was on the throne of hastinapura and that was his duty just as you have a job and it is your duty to serve your employers and sometimes you need to do things that your conscience may not entirely agree with that's exactly why he was on the side of the kauravas
we see here that Krishna, Arjun, Bhima, they're all called, they're, they're described. Krishna is called Lord of Senses. It's, uh, Arjun is called Winner of Wealth. Bhima, the one of fierce deeds. Throughout Indian scriptures, texts, not just the Mahabharata, also other texts, is there is a tradition to call the same person by different names. A name that describes a certain quality. Krishna is known here as Hishikesh, Lord of Senses. Arjun is known as Winner of Wealth, that is Dhananjay. He is Dhananjay, Winner of Wealth. And Bhima is known as Vikrodhara, which means the one who performs fierce deeds. Why are they given these names? These are highlighting certain qualities in them. And they tell us much more about them than a long description about them would tell us. Hishikesh, Lord of Senses, another word for Krishna, tells us a lot about the symbolism. He was master of the senses, of the Indriyas. Most of us have seen this picture of Krishna as a charioteer. He is guiding the, the horses. The horses are symbols of our Indriyas, our senses. And the reins are supposed to be manas. And Krishna is symbolic of buddhi, the lord of senses. So the senses, when they are well trained, when there are no conflicts, when the person is one-pointed, then they are all perfectly coordinated and are subservient to the buddhi. That means they follow buddhi. They follow the instructions of buddhi. The senses in the normal person are dragging us everywhere. If you go out somewhere and to the market and you see a wonderful um, cafe, ice cream parlor, your mind goes to the ice cream. You know, suddenly you feel like going and having ice cream even if you didn't want to. Then we smell some, have wonderful smells and, and you see a garden with roses or with, with lavender and some beautiful uh, smelling plants and her mind is immediately distracted by these fragrances. So these senses are always pulling us everywhere in the world. So the symbol of the chariot with the horses show that the horses are completely in the hands of Krishna. They are well trained horses and they are very obedient horses and that's how the Indriyas or the senses should be. Arjun is known as Dhananjay, winner of wealth. What does that mean? Does it mean he's, we are now all wanting to become materialistic and become wealthy? No, it means, what is wealth? Wealth is not merely financial wealth. It's not merely gold. Wealth has many forms. One has friends and family. That's, a, that's also wealth. You have health. Health is one of the greatest wealth that we can have. Without health, we can't do much in our life. We cannot succeed in anything without good health. That's also wealth that we have. Our talents, our abilities, these are also a great wealth that we possess. So in general, wealth here means prosperity. The mind that is one-pointed, and Arjun represents a one-pointed mind, can attain prosperity, both material as well as spiritual. Bhima of fierce deeds. Why is this being mentioned here? 
Bhima has a very important role to play. Arjun and Bhima were the strongest among the, the Pandavas. Bhima was very, very strong. Bhima, the son of Pavan, the wind god, the god of the wind, winds. He is mentioned here, again, because without determination, without Sankar Shakti, it is not possible to continue on this path. It's not possible to develop. So that's very important, that um, aspect as well is being highlighted here with these different names that are given. The others are all mentioned, they all have conscious and they all have names, the conscious as well have names. This gives us an idea into the power of sound and mantras. Sound has a very deep, deep impact on us. It goes very deep. And this is really the idea behind it is mantra, vidya. The concept is um, that sound is our essential nature. And so they have the individual sounds. It's like individual vibration. When a teacher initiates you into a mantra and gives you a very specific mantra, a bead mantra. There are universal mantras that everyone can use, but when you are initiated into this tradition, you get a bead mantra. And this is your guru mantra. It's just for you and no one else. It's just for you. And this mantra encapsulates your essence. That's what you are. It's your juice, so to say, a concentrated version of the person. So when they blow their conscious, in a sense, they are going back to that essence and calling upon that essence. Whenever we set out to do any important task, we need to sum up all our energies, <laughs> put it all together. And that is your essence when you do that. And that's the idea behind this. The idea behind mantras, the idea behind sound. Okay, so I'll just continue. To verse 19. Verse 19 is a continuation of the verses 12 to 18 because it also talks about sound. So verse 19 says, The tumultuous reverberating sound tore the hearts of the sons of Dhritarashtra, echoing all around the heaven and earth. So we see that Sound has a great power. It can strike at your very heart. All of us have heard the sound of thunder and it goes very deep into us. You know, it churns something up. We all like certain kind of music. Certain music inspires us, gives us a great deal of strength, energy. Some music makes us feel devotional, makes us emotional, makes us feel gratitude. Devotional music, hymns, bhajans, you know, religious music. Music that is very terrifying can frighten us. So music or sound has a very, very deep power which goes much deeper than words. You may have seen sometimes with people, they say something that means something else. Words account only for 10% of the language we use. 90% of what we say, we express through body language. So you see that words themselves are very, very shallow. But sounds go very deep, right to our very core. And that is the basis of 
मंत्र विद्या सो वर्स ट्वेंटी नाउ अर्जुन द सन ऑफ पांडु हु हैड हनुमान एस द एम्बलम ऑन हिज फ्लैग seeing the sons of dhritarashtra standing well organized as the weapons had begun to be hurled raised his bow so now arjun is ready for the battle he raises his bow this is a very um, interesting verse it seems quite insignificant but it is something to contemplate on why does arjun have hanuman as the emblem emblem on his flag for those of you who may not be familiar with this hanuman is the monkey god he is known as the devotee of ram and sita and his tales his heroic tales are narrated in the ramayan ramayan is the second great epic mahabharat is the longest epic with 100000 verses the ramayan is the second longest epic with 25000 verses the hero of the mahabharat is arjun and of course krishna and the hero of the raman is ram and his devotee hanuman and hanuman is a very important character in the raman he is absolutely uh, humble always serves ram ram who is consciousness symbol of center of consciousness Hanuman his servant is an ideal student an ideal student is one who is humble the student who is not humble the student who thinks he already knows everything cannot learn cannot grow cannot transform cannot really progress the ideal student is one who approaches with humility he serves his teacher or in this case it is ram who has chosen um representation of the divine hanuman just like bhishma is also a celebrate he is known throughout india as the ideal brahmachari celebrate and therefore he has withdrawn his energies from all worldly matters and devoted himself purely to the to the spiritual to the self to self transformation this is a symbol it doesn't mean that we all have to become celibates all have to take sanyas it is a symbol and we need to understand that we need to organize our lives prioritize our life and so we can do both but here hanuman is a symbol and because he is a celibate he has tremendous energy ah uh, there's somebody who's new here i need to mute you sujatha because we have some background noise from there okay Can you please mute yourself, Sujatha? I just muted you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Hanuman is the ideal student, the ideal seeker. He is humble. He is celibate. That is, he has devoted all his energies into spiritual growth. he too is the son of pavan the wind god indicating one needs a tremendous amount of determination 
to walk on this path. And another very, very important aspect here is that though he's the son of the wind god, he's a monkey. He's a monkey god. What does it mean? Why a monkey god? Well, what is the quality we know of monkeys? What do monkeys do generally? Monkeys are always running around like crazy, all over the place. They're very distracted. Very often we speak of the mind as a monkey mind. It's not a very healthy habit to do that because our mind serves us very well. Our mind can be our best friend or our worst enemy. And if we treat our mind as our enemy, it's not very useful. What we need to do is learn to train it and make it our best friend. And that is what Hanuman represents, a trained mind. A monkey that is well trained, obedient and humble and serving. So Hanuman is a well trained manas. And that's why the symbol here of Hanuman on the chariot of Arjun is very important. It indicates that we need to have a well trained manas. We need to have humility, we need to have sankalp, we need these qualities when we go into the battlefield of the mind, when we meditate. The next verses are verses 21 to 25. Then, O King Dhritarashtra, Arjun addressed these words to Krishna, Lord of the senses. O steady fast one, place my chariot between both armies, while I observe these who are standing here with whom I am about to fight in this battle. Um, sorry, Katna, you said something there? Okay, I presume that was just a little bit of a technical issue. And so I will continue. So Arjun says to Krishna, O steady fast one, place my chariot between both armies while I observe these who are standing here with whom I am about to fight in this battle. I would like to see these who have gathered here to fight, who are desirous of doing the wishes of the evil-minded son of Dhritarashtra in battle. Then, O descendant of Bharata, thus addressed by Arjun, the conqueror of sleep, Krishna, lord of senses, having placed the best of the chariots between both the armies, in front of Bhishma and Drona, and of all the kings, said, O son of Pritha, see all these Kauravas gathered together. So what's happening now? There's a change in the battlefield. Krishna, uh, Arjun, sorry, who was ready to start the battle, who had raised his bow, suddenly says to Krishna, who is his charioteer, please place my chariot between both the armies. Once again, he addresses Krishna as Lord of the Senses, Rishikesh, he addresses him as steady fast one, achyut. Steady fast one means one who is not um, doubtful, one who is not changing all the time. He is not fickle minded. So achyut means one who is not fickle minded. That's a trait of buddhi. Buddhi is not fickle minded. Buddhi is perfect. Buddhi knows what to do. 
takes firm decisions, clear decisions. So he explains this using these descriptions, highlighting these qualities. And he wants to go in the center there between the two armies and observe the battle. A lot of people who don't understand the symbolism of the Bhagavad Gita and take it literally ask, oh, how is it possible for Arjun to go in the center of the battlefield? There are two armies fully equipped and ready to start a battle and how can he go in the center of the battlefield? And how can they have this dialogue there when these two armies are waiting? It's 18 chapters, so it must have taken some amount of time. So they do not understand the symbolism. It's great literature. In literature, one takes creative license. This is a symbol. This is a metaphor. It's not to be taken literally. Now, of course, you don't go in the middle of two warring battle, uh, two warring armies and start having a spiritual discussion. That would be rather foolish. Here, it means you're going into the center, looking at both sides. You are trying to be neutral. You're trying to get an overview. You're trying to be a witness. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to understand both the sides. He wants to see those who have gathered to support the Tarashtra and Duryodhan because these are all the negative traits. So he wants to look at also the negative traits, the negative qualities. And he wants to look at those also on the side of the Pandavas. So they go to the center of the battlefield and Krishna says, O son of Pritha, Pritha is another uh, name for his mother Kunti, so son of Pritha, see all these Kauravas gathered here. And so the idea here is to observe the strength of your enemy, to know what you're dealing with, but also to know yourself. You need to know both. To try to take a neutral stance. This is an important bhava in meditation. Another word for this is vairagya. To try to attain this stance or attitude is very important in meditation. Otherwise, we are always falling into the negative or the positive. Either negative or positive, both are aspects of duality. Those on the spiritual path wishing to attain the absolute reality, the highest non-dual reality. They want to go beyond both negative as well as positive. And so, here we are talking about a very important attitude or bhava called vairagya. One of the most important things we need to learn in meditation. We cannot progress in meditation without having understood and having got a glimpse of vairagya. Vairagya is not something life-defeating. Uh, it's not something dry and boring. It doesn't mean you have no emotions. Vairagya means you, in fact, really know how to enjoy your life because you have a little distance. When you have a little distance, you can enjoy things even more. When you get lost into something completely, you get so involved that you go up and down with, with life. When you go in the highs, you are high, and in the lows, you are at rock bottom. When you have a neutral stance, you can observe and enjoy, like you, you enjoy a movie. 
or you enjoy a, a drama. You are not participating in the drama. You are outside and you enjoy it. And that is the stance we are talking about here. He is trying to acquire the stance of a meditator. The stance of witnessing. I wanted to just ask uh, something about Arjun. Mm -hmm. Is he actually... Uh, Joachim, uh, you didn't finish your sentence. Oh, because I muted myself by mistake, sorry. Okay. So, the question was, how is Arjun actually prepared? And they don't talk about this. Uh, he's just there. And uh, so, what is the preparation part for this? Okay, very good question. Excellent question. Um, now, in the next paragraphs, Arjun goes and stands there in front of the Kaura army and he's looking at these friends, relatives, teachers mostly. His grandsire Bhishma, who is uh, commander in chief of the Kaura army, and Drona, his own teacher. Now, if we understand the symbolism, we are talking about Krishna being normally the teacher of Arjun. In our tradition we say he's a revered friend and he's a symbol of buddhi. So who prepared Arjun? Who prepared him? His teacher Duryodhan, uh, his, sorry, his teacher Dronacharya. His teacher Dronacharya was a Brahmin teacher who taught the Kshatriya princes um, all about uh, warfare and archery. So he was the one who trained them. Again, the symbolism of archery is one-pointedness, one-pointed mind. That's what you need to do in meditation, you know? You need to be focused. And so archery is a symbolism here. And his teacher was Dronacharya, who helped him train his mind. There are some very nice stories in the Mahabharata about this training process. One example is given when all the princes were training in archery and one of the tasks given to them was to shoot the eye of a bird. It was a, it was a little toy bird which was put on a tree. And Drona gives them the task of shooting or aiming at the eye of the bird on the tree. And so all the princes try one by one. And Drona asks them, what do you see? And the prince would say, oh, I see the tree and I see the leaves and I see the bird. And, and he would not let them shoot. He'd say, okay, fine, next. The next prince came and he said, oh, what do you see? Oh, I see the tree and I see the leaves and I see the bird. And he said, okay, next. He was also not allowed to shoot until Arjun comes. And he asks, Arjun, what do you see? And Arjun says, I see the eye of the bird and nothing else. And so Drona says, you may shoot. He is teaching and training the princes in how to develop and train the mind in concentration, in one-pointedness. It is a symbolism, a deep symbolism of how we train ourselves to prepare ourselves for the inner guru, the inner teacher, that is Krishna here, Buddhi. So the teacher outside, the guru outside leads us to the guru within. And Krishna is that voice of wisdom within us. So the preparation took place much earlier, before the Bhagavad Gita starts. And Krishna was prepared by Dronacharya.
So we see these little uh, stories. Um, they have a lot of meaning. And the entire Mahabharata and of course the Bhagavad Gita, it teaches us at different levels. It's not merely at the level of words. You know, you don't just take the words, whatever they say, literally, but it is also teaching at a much deeper, subtler level, in the form of symbols as well. And that is why these stories were also narrated to children. Because when children absorb these stories, it goes very deep into the unconscious mind. When we contemplate on these stories, we can go deeper into the symbolism and understand these. Unconsciously, when we bring them into our conscious awareness, of course, that's even better. But when we teach these stories to our children, or we tell these to a younger generation, and they grow up with these, these go very deep inside. And that is with all stories which have, are very symbolic in nature. They appeal to the unconscious mind. And so we train our unconscious mind as well. Not just training the conscious mind, but also the unconscious mind. So verses 26 to 28. There, the son of Pritha saw those who were like fathers and grandfathers to him, teachers, uncles, brothers, sons, grandsons, as well as companions, fathers-in-law, as well as friends in both armies, seeing all those kinsmen standing there, Arjun, the son of Kunti, possessed by a pitiful mood feeling very sad, said these words, I see these kinsmen present here with the intent to fight. So he gets very despondent. Arjun sees that these are his family, his friends. He's identifying with them. And that's what happens when we start our meditation. We get identified with our thoughts, negative or positive. They are my thoughts. So if I have negative thoughts, I identify with them and I feel bad. I condemn myself and that makes me weak. If I have positive thought, I get proud of that. Oh, I'm very, I have wonderful thoughts, I'm very proud of it. Or I want more of something, I get greedy then. And that also makes me weak because all these strengthen the thoughts and the samskaras in us. Yeah. Kalpana, you wanted to say something? Yes? Yeah, okay. So, when we identify with our thoughts, negative or positive, we become weak. And then, of course, when we see ourselves more clearly, remember he is now standing in the middle of the battlefield. He has taken the stance of Vairagya. What happens when you take a stance of Vairagya? In meditation, it means that both negative as well as positive thoughts start appearing. You become more conscious of yourself. One tends to become more conscious of the negative thoughts earlier because those are the ones that have been suppressed, repressed in our mind, into our unconscious mind. And so, when the negative thoughts start coming forward and you start identifying with them and you say, oh, I'm a bad person, what happens? You get sad, you get depressed, you condemn yourself. And I think we all know this, we all have had this experience that it is very difficult to be honest to oneself. It's very easy 
to see others clearly. It's very easy to look at others and be critical and say, oh, this person is too proud and arrogant and this person is, you know, has a lot of jealousy and negative traits. But when it comes to ourselves, we have a very hard time being objective. But that is exactly what we need to do. And so what happens when we do that? We get depressed. We lose hope. We feel we are worthless, useless, not deserving any wonderful teachings, not deserving any good teachers, not deserving any the beautiful tradition. And we say, oh, I don't deserve all these wonderful things. I wonder why my teacher loves me and cares for me so much. I'm such a bad person. I don't deserve this love. And that's a natural um, thing that happens when one begins meditation. And when this happens, a lot of sincere seekers give up. Just like Arjun gave up. He put down his bow, uh, arrow and everything and said, Oh, I'm not going to do this. I can't fight. I can't fight against these people. This is too much. And you look at your negative qualities and you say, Oh, I'm so worthless. How can I fight against this? This is so overwhelming. I'm never going to be able to deal with these negative traits in myself. And you lose hope. You get depressed. And you say, Oh, this meditation and all this stuff. Oh, this is actually dangerous. And most students who are very sincere, start off very well, they turn back. They don't want to continue. They stop because it seems too hard. If they don't have good guidance, if the voice of Buddhi is not sharp enough yet, and if they don't have a good teacher, like Arjun had a great teacher like Dronacharya, who prepared him, and if you don't have a great teacher, like your inner voice as well as an external teacher, then what happens is you give up. You don't continue. You stop. And then that's the end of your spiritual journey. And this year is meant to help us, um, give us strength, and say, yes, these relatives there are those you identify with. These are the ones you identify with. These are identities we have picked up on the way. This is nothing but the ego, which is suffering. And this is what we need to work with. The ego gets a blow and it wants to give up. And that, of course, would be defeating the purpose. That would, would, be a, would be very sad if one would give up. <clears throat> yes, Radhika, I have a question. Yes. Yes, uh, this Krishna is pure consciousness. Mm -hmm. And you just now said Krishna is Bhutti. Yes. Uh, so I want to just understand this uh, difference, this pure consciousness and the buddhi. About little bit, I know that buddhi is a way to reach to pure consciousness. Yes, buddhi uh, helps to reach to pure consciousness. So here, the where the Krishna stands, buddhi is the same as pure consciousness, but it has manifested. It's the most sattvic part of us, and. It's not different from pure consciousness itself. Only this has manifested. Pure consciousness does not manifest. It is consciousness. Okay? Okay, okay. thank you so much. Okay. Verse 29 and 30. We just do that before we end this session. My limbs are frozen. My mouth is drying up. My body trembles and hairs stand on end. Gandiva, the great bow, is slipping from my hand and my skin is burning. Nor can I stand up. My mind is, as it were, whirling. 
once again a very important aspect in meditation when one starts the process of meditation and starts dealing with the identities the self identities that is nothing other than our ego and we begin to see our negative qualities in us <clears throat> you you feel lost you are unable to deal with all these things and there's a great deal of self condemnation and that turmoil is experienced here even at a physical level we we know that when we are under a great deal of stress you may have all experiences at some point or other when you are under a great deal of emotional stress or stress uh, you know due to uh, work reasons your body is affected you are you are affected at a physical level where you may have such experiences as well you get headaches you you start falling sick you get tensed your limbs are not your your muscles are frozen seem to get very tense you are not able to think properly your mind is whirling and that's exactly you say i can't even stand up i feel so weak i cannot take this and this is a situation that arjun is right now he's feeling stressed it's stress is a very modern word so it may sound odd when we are using it in the context of the mahabharat but stress is very old it's not new it is simply the situation where the mind is in conflict when manas buddhi chitta and ahankara are not coordinated when the chitta comes up with some old memories attachments from ahankara manas is now beginning to to lose control and under that stress that turmoil which takes place this is a very very important step in meditation those who start meditating if they are really meditating and that's an important um qualification here that real meditation is different from sitting in meditation a lot of people may be sitting in meditation but do not necessarily attain any states of meditation and that's that's a big difference you could be sitting there but not having attained a deeper state then you may not experience this and you may say hmm i i never had this what's this all about but if you've attained a deeper state of meditation where you have become self aware where you begin to get to know yourself then you will experience also things at a physical level you may find to your shock that you may even get sick this process is known as fast fructifying karma this is mentioned in a little bit more detail in the yoga sutras and fast fructifying karma means that things are starting to manifest and that is an important aspect also in meditation getting to know yourself at a deeper level whether negative or positive means you accelerate the process of samskaras manifesting in the world and that's a good process not everybody sees it that way because most of us are trained to think that meditation or yoga or spirituality means being good it means not doing anything it means you know being yogi and that's not what spirituality means because when you start meditating and you get to know yourself you will find that you instead of getting healthier initially get more sick and that's the process of purification which may take place not only at a mental level but also at a physical level it can manifest in the form of disease or sickness all right so let us stop here we have uh, done quite a bit and i'm going to let this sink in for you and we continue next friday from here and um 
I hope you all uh, enjoyed it, found it useful, and hope you all have a nice weekend. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Radhika. <laughs> Thank Welcome, you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Radhika ji. It's really beneficial. It's too good. Yeah. Most Thank welcome, you. Kalpana. <laughs> bye bye, Sandra. Bye, Samit, Anju. Bye, Miklosh, Matthias. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye, Scott. <laughs> bye, Scott. Bye, bye. bye, everybody. Thank bye. you so much. Bye, everyone. Goodbye, Radhika Ji. Thank you. Goodbye, Samia. It was nice having you here. <laughs>